Hi, I'm Frank Washcook, news editor of PR Week, and I'm happy to be joined by Mijo Spring. She is the uh, chair of Weber Shanwick's Global Corporate Practice. So, Mijo, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, Weber recently did a survey uh, about corporate. Uh, why don't you fill us in on some of the findings from the survey? So, we talked to uh, 19, um, a, a combination of general counsel and uh, communicators across industries who had managed crisis in the last um, year or two, and it was really a wide variety of crisis. It was interesting to see the, the how varied, how different they were, but through it all, uh, we saw certain trends which were quite interesting in how the relationship between lawyers and communicators mm -hmm. is really evolving in this very different um, you know, era that we live in where you've got to respond to crisis instantly, where you're um, not, it's no longer whether or not a company will uh, face a crisis, but when they'll face a crisis and where everybody sees how a company responds to crisis as, as a defining moment in terms of uh, reputation. So it's, it was a very interesting uh, set of findings. Were there any specific industries that did better than others uh, that were standouts, so to speak? I don't think so. I think uh, whether it was a product recall or whether it was a CEO succession issue that the, um, the, the um, what was interesting was to see how um, both sides, it used to be two sides of the fence, right, communicators sure. on one side and lawyers on the other, have, how both of them have um, learned how to think horizontally mm -hmm. and really across stakeholders. So I think the recognition that reputation involves everybody working uh, on the same page mm -hmm. has really taken hold, at least um, it's, it's widely improved. And I think that that actually is helpful um, to CEOs because the last thing you want to do is, is have a, a, a varied advice that's that's uh, conflicting advice. Right. Much right. easier. And we tend to cover the communicator aspect of crisis situations a lot. We don't tend to cover the legal aspects or the, the lawyer driven aspects. So maybe you can tell us a little bit how about that has changed. Well, in, recent years. in the old world it was the lawyer saying say nothing and it was the communicator <laughs> saying say everything. Right. And obviously we have both learned to walk in each other's shoes right. and we understand that you know there's one a one wonderful quote by a lawyer that says the legal radar extends beyond liability. Mm -hmm. uh, if you really understand, you've got to really understand the, the full impact on, on the business, mm -hmm. not just on whether or not success in either reputation or business is not just avoiding litigation or avoiding regulatory um, issues. It's really understanding how to weigh the trade-offs. Um, and so what we saw were um, people who were uh, learning how to work with each other. Uh, best, of course, best practices when they go into a crisis already knowing each other and having a relationship. So that says something to the corporate suite, which is make sure that you're preparing and that you're, you're building relationships among all the key members of the team who need to weigh all the trade-offs when you're confronting a crisis. Mm -hmm. Now we see a lot of examples in the news of large organizations, large companies that don't seem to be prepared for a crisis uh, that maybe they know is about to hit. You know, uh, a lot of our readers have used Penn State as an example. Um, what's a, what is a reason that a large organization tends to not be ready for a crisis when it's about to hit? Well, it's hard um, to be in today's environment and read the papers and not think, oh my God, this could also be me, right? right. Because the range of issues that come, it doesn't have to be a crisis, it can just be a negative event. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it, it, especially in this world of social media, uh, you're, and transparency, you're so exposed at so many different levels. So it, I cannot explain why anybody would not be reading the front pages and say, am I prepared? And the interesting thing about the survey is that it used to be that best practice was really imagining you know, what the negative events could be and preparing contingency plans, plans against it. Sure. I remember we used to say, okay, tell us your three worst nightmares and let's talk about what's the holding statement, what's the Q&A, who's in the room. Mm -hmm. And that's not enough anymore because no matter what the people in the survey said, is no matter what a great imagination you have and all the negative events you can foresee, you can never be prepared enough. So I think the, the, the interesting insight is that you need, it's a cultural change mm -hmm. um, is what's needed so that you evolve into a culture, a culture of preparedness, of alertness so that everybody knows that if something hits, there's a, a kind of a shortcut that needs to be 
um, you know, uh, triggered, where you can make decisions rapidly, you can decide what to say, and the right people are in the room to okay it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's it's more the evolution of to a culture of preparedness than having the best set of contingencies that you can think of. Very interesting. Again, this is Mijo Spring from Weber Shanwick, and I'm Frank Washcook, the news editor at PR Week. Thanks again.